All right, this is um, Dr. Martin. We're going to talk about um, the uh, servos, H bridges, and power control things uh, for Micro 2. Uh, so this is the lecture I for week 9, as you can see here, the 23rd, that's today. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'll probably say a few things about uh, the tilt tables. I did do a recording um, over the weekend uh, on how to calibrate your tilt table, and I definitely want you to take a look at that. That's also posted on Blackboard under the uh, videos for S21. Um, so I probably will do a quiz on this video today, so make sure you take a look at that quiz and do that. Um, so uh, we, normally in this course, we do the tilt table and the cup car. And uh, the cup car has a steering servo, but the power, the drive force for the cup car is some standard uh, DC motors with gear reduction to the wheels. And uh, those standard uh, DC uh, motors, little DC motors, there are two of them, one for each rear wheel, uh, they are controlled by two different H bridges. And um, here's what it looks like on the, the motor shield of the cup car. We'll pop this up here. These chips right here are the two um, uh, H bridges, A and B. And if you flip this over and look at it, uh, you can see there's a big, uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of copper that that has no uh, solder mask over it, and uh, partly that's just to help dissipate heat. These uh, these have a lot of solder. Uh, there's a big heat sink on the bottom of these chips, and they're soldered uh, pretty uh, solidly to the to the board. Besides just the pins for electrical connection, there's also the thermal connection, and um, and so that that uh, helps dissipate the heat. These these are able to dissipate the heat into the printed circuit board, and uh, and that's partly why there's no paint on here to help uh, have that heat dissipate. Um, so the 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 power for this comes from uh, this this battery connector here, and it's driven by it's powered by the same 7.2 volt battery that we're using for the tilt tables. But uh, for the cars, that battery pulls a lot of power, and uh, and the, and the nice thing we'll we'll look at these H bridges. But these are two commercial H bridges made by Freescale uh, now NXP, and that's why they use them on on this uh, on this little uh, motor shield. We're not going to do the cup car this semester uh, just because of the logistical uh, difficulties of making that work. You pretty much have to have, have to come in the lab and do it in lab. You cannot do it um, at home because you don't have a track. And without the track, you really can't do it. Uh, and the track you know, sounds like it's not a big deal, but actually the track is a big deal. It, we spent, I don't know, uh, five or $600 on the track. Uh, we had laser cut forms for a bridge. We had... Uh, we spent a lot of time in my garage uh, stenciling, uh, taping, and uh, and spray painting the uh, the edges and cutting out the the the, the plastic track from big sheets of plastic. Uh, we spent a lot of money. We spent a lot of time uh, to develop this, and um, and and we created a track that was virtually identical to the uh, to the the actual race track that was used by. Uh, Freescale when they did these competitions around the country and uh, that enabled us to take first, second, and third place the last time we competed regionally and second place when we competed nationally twice. Uh, two years in a row we did second place nationally uh, but regionally the first time we competed we did first and third, the second time we did first, second, and third uh, in the Midwest Regional. Uh, so we, we pretty much killed it. But we did that because we uh, we had uh, a, an identical track to practice on with an identical hill, and uh, and that that really made a big difference. Unfortunately, that competition was terminated when NXP bought Freescale. I don't know. They talked about bringing it back, but they haven't done that yet. Uh, so I don't know. Anyway, maybe one of these days we'll do it again. This semester we're not going to do it because uh, most students aren't coming to lab, so that's what we're stuck with. But we are doing the tilt table, and I think you'll find that that's going to be, uh, hopefully, enough work. Um, all right. Let me just 
shrink this down. Uh, oh, I see how to do this. Okay, so anyway, uh, and I guess I'll shrink this down too. Okay, so so I'm going to go through. Uh, I'm going to, but nonetheless, H bridges are important, and and of course our tilt table uses servo. So I want to talk about these things, and uh, talk a little bit about power control. Um, I I feel like this is an important place to introduce this. Uh, you might or might not ever really get this anywhere else in your coursework, unless you do a an elective course uh, in the robotic stuff, where hopefully they do talk about this a little more. Okay. So that's what we're going to cover. Um, so uh, let's talk about H bridges. So the reason that these are called H bridges is because they, they look a lot like an H. You put your motor in the middle and you have one, two, three, four switches in a full H bridge. Sometimes people will do a half H bridge, uh, but uh, we're going to do a full H bridge. and. Um, Usually the way this works here we have I'm showing mechanical switches, but obviously we normally and and you know in the old days these motors were controlled by mechanical switches. That's how they work. Nowadays, of course, it's all all digital. These these switches have been replaced either by BJTs, but mostly by FETs, uh, power FETs, and um, they they allow you to switch big currents and rather quickly. And so we can do all sorts of uh, control algorithms we never could do before. And um, so we're going to talk about these. But first, I just want to talk about the basic H. And here we have power. Uh, I call it VCC, but this would be motor power, not, not normally the digital power for the control, for the control uh, logic. Control logic is going to run at 3.3 .3 or 5 volts or 1.8 volts or something. But these H bridges are going to run, you know, anywhere from, you know, 7 or 8 to 35 volts, maybe 12 or 24 volts are kind of typical numbers. And the so this is this would be power up here. So think 12 volts, 24 volts, and here's ground. Now the motor is a DC motor, and it, it, the direction it runs depends on uh, the polarity of the power provided to it. So if you make this terminal positive and this terminal negative, the motor will run say clockwise. And if you reverse that, the motor runs counterclockwise. This is used to great advantage. Uh, when we uh, when we have uh, power tools like a hand drill and you want to be able to reverse it and uh, all those all those power tools use H bridges to drive them and there's a lot of good reasons why we use H bridges uh, and we control the H bridges with PWM and there's a lot of good reasons why we do that uh, the biggest is that that when we use an H bridge with PWM it allows us to provide full power to our device so that it, that it runs like it's supposed to, but we can control the, the amount of energy that goes to the device and therefore its rotational speed by changing the duty cycle. If we tried to just do this with, uh, say, a rheostat and vary the voltage, it, it doesn't work very well because the, the motor is very nonlinear. And when you get down below a certain voltage, it's not enough to, to cause the motor to rotate. And so it stalls out at low RPM and stops turning and just gets hot, and that's not what we want. Also, as you decrease the drive voltage, there's very there, the torque goes way, way down, and so there's very little power, and at, at slow rotational speeds, there's almost no power. So it, a drill basically doesn't work uh, when you try and control it by uh, its RPM by varying just the voltage. What you have to do instead is vary the duty cycle and give it full voltage or be fully off. And, uh, and all you do then is vary the percentage of time that it's fully on uh, for each duty cycle. And then you repeat the duty cycle at a pulse repetition rate that gives you, uh, that, that, that basically fuses the motion so that it doesn't, uh, so, it, so you don't see it, so you don't, so the motor's not actually operating in spurts. It's, it's getting uh, enough continuous power that it's, that it's, uh, that it's working continuously. It's sort of like you could replace this with an LED, and uh, you, when, with an LED, you don't want to see the LED blink as you vary the intensity. Well, it's the same thing with the motor, but, but the, uh, the fusion rate for the motor is a lot slower than it is for an LED. Um, for an LED, you probably have to get it up above 100, 150, uh, um, you know, 200 uh, hertz or something like that to fuse the, the LED, but with the motor, you can do it 
at probably lower frequencies. However, uh, our, our pulse frequency with a typical H bridge for a typical DC motor uh, is very often maybe, uh, a, you know, maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten kilohertz, something like that. So it is pretty fast usually. Uh, we're, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's pretty quick. And that's, there are other reasons driving that. Um, but obviously you can't go very fast because the motor is, is a mechanical device and at some point uh, it's just, uh, it's, it, it's not going to respond to very high frequency signals. Obviously a few kilohertz is all, about all you can do with a real DC motor. All right, so what you can see as you look at this diagram is a couple of things. One, you can see that, that uh, we have power here, ground down here. If we connected these two switches, we'd have a short circuit. Or if we connect these two switches, we have a short circuit. So we never can have all the switches uh, 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 closed at any one given time. Usually, we only have two switches closed at any given time. And if you have more than that, you're going to have a big problem with a short circuit. You're going to cause a fire, burn up your power supply. Something bad is going to happen. Um, and not so much to the motor, because it's sort of protected, but to your, uh, to your wiring, your control circuitry, your battery. A lot of things are going to be stressed, and, and, and you might very well catch fire. So you only have two switches. Typically, either the plus here and the minus here and the ground switch here closed, or if you want to run the other direction, this switch closed and this switch closed and these two switches open. So uh, we can we can do we can replace the switches with a uh, with a BJT. Now here we're controlling the BJT with a switch, but normally we'd actually control the BJT with a microprocessor input. Um, so here's here's the H bridge with BJT is replacing, and here here through a, through a uh, uh, through a, a base resistor we see we have the drive we have four drive points from our microprocessor, and um, and a lot of microprocessors have uh, have the, the ability to drive these directly uh, by setting up uh, a, a four channel output. The the PIC chip our PIC chip can do this. You could use the the uh, PIC. Uh, Six, uh, the PIC 16 F1829 connected directly to this, and and uh, and you can control the motor with that. It's it's not a perfect setup because uh, there are there's some technical issues that make it less than perfectly ideal. But it certainly would work for uh, any any reasonable size motor. Um, but super powerful motors, uh, you'd have to rethink it because you need uh, some additional protections. Um, all right, and even here we need to add some some issues. Um, one of the things we need here are we need uh, some uh, some back EMF uh, resistors. Well, first off, let's look at and see how it works. So normally you'd have say this this transistor would be in saturation, and the this one would be in cutoff, and then this one would be in saturation, and this would be in cutoff. <coughs> so. Um, and typically what you have up here is a PNP and what you have down here is an MPN. And so that makes it very easy for the micro to control it. Uh, it can control it with, you know, uh, 5 volts easily, probably even 3.3 volts. And so when we turn this one on, we turn this one off, turn this one on and turn this one off, and we have the current flowing through it in this direction, the motor runs, say, in the clockwise manner. And then obviously we can switch that around by putting this in cutoff and this into saturation, and this into saturation, and this into cutoff. And now we're running counterclockwise. So we can reverse the motor uh, with our microprocessor. So that gives the microprocessor control over the motor. But this doesn't give it control over the motor's speed, per se. To do that, we need a little more sophistication. Now, to make this work, we normally do have to have these flyback diodes. Which, uh, which provide a pathway for current to run in the opposite direction. And uh, the reason for this is that when we switch these, uh, these BJTs, the motor continues to turn and generate a back EMF, which then needs a pathway to be conducted in order to avoid 
uh, it's ramping its voltage up sky high and, and uh, reverse biasing our BJTs and blowing them up. So we don't want that, so we, so we have to put these flyback diodes in. And notice they're, they're in the wrong direction. So they're, they're back, back reverse biased here. Now, we'll take those out so just to minimize the amount of clutter, but they have to be there. Now, if we would ever turn two of these transistors on at the same time, you would get what you would get a short circuit and you would definitely burn them up you might even you might even gener, you know, might even cause a fire all right so and I, I think I did that yeah all right there are basically two ways to control this H bridge using uh, PWM and what makes PWM so attractive here is if we go back to this picture if we control these instead of just you know this one on this one on these two off if we if we turn these on but we vary the duty cycle and we provide these flyback diodes so that we have some place for the energy to go and I'll, I'll talk about some other things too but uh, but often when we do that what we do is uh, we never uh, when we want to PWM these we never we never let's say we have these two conduct this one conducting and this one conducting and these two off. When we would PWM it, we would only PWM this transistor. We would not PWM both of them. And the reason we wouldn't do that is that we we want to leave one of these transistors, one of these transistors needs to be on all the time to provide a, a pathway for the for the uh, back EMF to flow through. All right. So there are two ways to do this and they're called locked antiphase and sine and magnitude. Uh, both of these are, are, use PWM and an H bridge. Now, uh, it turns out the locked antiphase seems really counterintuitive, but it actually probably is the better choice. Um, and the way this works, you you alternately drive the motor forward and reverse. So, for half for part of the duty cycle, it's in forward mode. And for the other half of the duty cycle, it's in reverse mode. And you switch this mode at somewhere around 7, 8, 9, 10 kilohertz. When you want the motor to be totally stopped, you, then your duty cycle is set to 50%. So you're driving it forward half the time and reverse half the time uh, every uh, you know 10,000 times a second, basically. You're switching those. Uh, and the only other thing you have to do is... Uh, you, 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 well, you would think, well, if that's the case, why, do, why would you need those reverse diodes then? Because you're always conducting it one way or the other. But the problem is there's always a little switch over time. And when you do the switch over time, let's see, when you do the switch over time, you, you, you want to avoid even, even a few microseconds where this transistor is still on and then you cut this transistor on as well, giving this short circuit. You don't ever want to have that. So you want to make sure if you're switching, say, from, from these two being on to these two being on, you want to make sure you turn these two off first and then turn these two on. So there's just a little dead band space in there where everything's off. And when, when you have everything off, that's when you, uh, that's when you, you have to have the diodes. So that's that's when the, the diodes are really critical, and um, and so uh, they they basically provide the protection for that that teeny tiny amount of time where you're in the dead band and everything is off. But again, you generally you you don't want to leave it off for very long. You you want you want that just to be a teeny teeny fraction of time so that you give these transistors uh, time to cut off. And that does provide some control or a limit to how fast you can switch this besides the mechanics of the motor and the sheer, uh, the sheer time it takes for as the motor moves for the, and, and for the fields to, to build, uh, build and collapse. Uh, you also have to have a little bit of consideration for the amount of switching time that your, that your solid state uh, elements take, whether they're FETs or BJTs. Uh, and they can switch pretty fast, but there, there are limits. So, so for most DC motors, the, that sweet spot's going to be down in, you know, a few, 
a few kilohertz, maybe, you know, again, 7, 8, 9, 10, maybe up to 12, 13, 14, 15, something like that, uh, in, somewhere in that range. But if you get too fast, then, then you have trouble with the motor responding, and you also uh, start pushing the, the switching limits on some of these uh, high-powered uh, um, FETs. All right, so, so we have to have this little bit of dead band to prevent shoot through during during the switching process, so that our so that none of our active elements are ever both conducting on the same side to allow for even a small amount of shoot through, because that would give you a big big spike in current during that shoot through time. And uh, even though it might be very brief, uh, over a period of a you know a few minutes or hours, that could definitely add up to uh, some real heat generation, and that could be a problem. Um, so, so if we do sine and magnitude the way this works, um, so so locked anti-phase, we're alternately driving the motor forward and reverse very quickly, and stop is a 50% duty cycle. But in sine magnitude, what we do is we leave both bottom switches are on. Uh, well. Yeah, well, we can't. Yeah, we can't. We we can't have them both on. But what we do is we we have the one of them is selected to be on all the time, and then one of the top switches is PWM'd so that it goes on and off to control the energy to the motor. And then a second line controls the direction and changes which top switch is used by the PWM. But again, the, the you don't have both bottom switches on uh, uh, because you'd get shoot through on the on the side uh, where you're turning on the top switch. So you, you just have the one switch on. All right, uh, you can't switch both top and bottom switches. Uh, now this, this seems like, seems a little counterintuitive, but if you do that, when, both, when, all, when all the switches are off, there's no path for the back EMF. Even with the, even with the uh, diodes, you still need to have one of your uh, active elements conducting either in the top loop or the bottom loop. And uh, because this motor is a very high inductive inductor, uh, it really does resist any sudden change in current. And that voltage can rise quite high uh, so that you can actually have arcing across your, your solid state components. And that's, of course, bad. So the locked anti-phase is somewhat counterintuitive. Uh, and it looks like it would use a lot of power uh, because you're alternately driving the motor forward and backward, you know, 10,000 times a second. But because the, because the motor's inductance effectively creates this low pass filter and filters the current to essentially a DC value, at a 50% duty cycle, the average current is essentially zero and the motor remains stopped. Uh, and then when you want to run it one direction, then you move the duty cycle say to 60 or 70 or 80 percent or if you want it full forward say you go to 100 percent on the other hand if you want to move it reverse you go to 40 percent or 30 percent or 20 percent and if you want it in full reverse you go to zero percent duty cycle and that's basically how that works but of course the motor is not a perfect low pass filter and so you do get a little bit of ripple and um if you if if there if the motor doesn't have any, very much inductance at all, then there'll be a lot of ripple and the power loss will go out, and you'll also be able to feel some vibration when the motor is stopped. All right, so so locked anti-phase is uh, is really uh, maybe the best way to go. Uh, the the difference you can think about this uh, versus sine magnitude. Uh, it, it's it's if you're controlling, say, the descent of a robot down a ramp. With sine magnitude, it's like pushing the robot down the ramp with your hand. Uh, and if the ramp is steep enough, the robot will accelerate away from your hand and you lose control. Whereas if locked anti-phase, it's like holding onto the robot with both hands and guiding it down the ramp and the, the robot will only go as fast as you dictate. So there's, there's something to be said. Now, if you actually look, put on an oscilloscope and look at, the, at this pulse, uh, at one, one PWM cycle, uh, you'll see all this crazy stuff going on. The switch is on, and then the switch goes to zero. Uh, 
we have some noise from the brushes, these little things here, these little spiky things. You have uh, a voltage spike, then this current decay, then you have the back EMF voltage uh, right in here. And so, uh, and, and including well, the voltage spike. So, so, there's, so the, this, the science behind all that's going on here is quite complicated. Uh, we'll take just a little bit more of a look at this in a second. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we build the H bridge. So you can use BJTs or FETs, uh, but basically most really good H bridges are made out of FETs and most of the good H bridges use only N channel FETs. Now I, I hopefully before the end of the course I'll do a little demonstration with field effect transistors. Hopefully you've looked at these in lab one or two and you have some feel for these. Uh, but uh, we'll do a little bit of review just so you know. But one of the things that's BJTs are pretty symmetric. Whether you're talking about an MPN or a PMP, uh, the, the voltage drop across the junctions are pretty similar. Uh, but with FETs, that's not true. With FETs, we're more worried about the on-channel resistance. Uh, when the, the channel is fully turned on, uh, what's, the, what's the effective uh, resistance through the channel? And it turns out the end channel has about a tenth of the on-channel resistance that a P-channel FET does, and that's got to do with um, quantum mechanic considerations on the flow of holes versus the flow of electrons. And holes apparently just don't flow as well. So, uh, so, so the end channel FET has, uh, no matter you know what you buy, uh, for the same basic you know type of FET, you're going to get about a tenth of the on-channel resistance in a in an N-channel FET than you would in a P-channel FET. So for that reason, we, we generally do want to use N-channel FETs on both the low side and the high side. The problem with using them on the high side is that you have to take your, your, your floating gate has to go above your um, uh, So the, again, the, the problem so with an end channel is that uh, you have to take the, uh, the gate, uh, well, when you're on the high side, so you're controlling, you're, you're putting the end channel FET on the high side. So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's this switch here or this switch here. When you do that, because you have to get the gate above the source voltage uh, with uh, with with this end channel, then that means that that your gate control voltage, say you're running this at 24 volts, so your gate control voltage has to be maybe even seven or eight volts above that in order to fully turn on the uh, the the MOSFET, and uh, to do that. You have to have, uh, uh, you know, say, uh, say you have to get up uh, eight volts. You'd have to have 33 volts in, to apply to the to the gate. Well, the the micro doesn't operate at 33 volts, so that's going to be very difficult. Plus, you don't even have a 33 volt source. So we'll we'll talk about that problem later on in a, in, in a minute. But uh, it's uh, it's definitely an issue, and. Uh, so what you see is that some of these uh, some of these H bridges have built-in charge pumps to generate these higher voltages, and there's some other solutions you can use as too, like bootstrap capacitors and things like that. Um, most most of these H bridges come with all the end channel FETs sort of built into them, and and some special inputs for turning things on and off. So um, they have the built-in flyback diodes, uh, other safety features, and then some of them even have features you can use for braking and coasting. And, uh, and a lot of these are available. They're very, uh, they're often pretty uh, inexpensive even. So here's, a, here's an example of one. Uh, this would be the PIC. Uh, this is a picture using a 16F690, but same idea. Ours has this same exact thing. We have uh, the uh, the PWM channel one 
has uh, the ability to be put in a mode where it has four outputs, P1A, P1B, P1C, and P1D. And you can route those to uh, four of these BJTs with uh, NPNs up, uh, up here, uh, sorry, with PNPs up here. Well, I guess in this case, we're using the same one. Uh, and the, uh, so we can, yeah, we're using the same one in, in, in all four. Uh, you can see that these are the bypass diodes that control the back EMF. And then here's the motor with, some, with a little filter cap on it to try and minimize some of the noise. And here's our motor power and motor ground, which is a common ground with our microprocessor. And then we have our little base resistors here, 2.2Ks. And that's how they work. And this is using a BC639, which can handle a, you know, a fair amount of current. So this is, this is one using all NPN transistors. Um, here's one, uh, here's the one that's actually on the motor shield, the MC33887 uh, Freescale H bridge. Now this, this picture is actually wrong. I, I have no idea why they did that, but uh, they, they turned this into a P channel, but it is not in this H bridge, it is an N channel. And I'll show you in a minute. Uh, a, a diagram that's actually got it right. Uh, but this one was wrong. And I, this came, I think this comes straight out of one of the free, Freescale publications, so it's interesting. Uh, you can put in this, uh, this EMI suppression cap here, and then you do need Schottky diodes here, and Schottky so that they're fast, because these diodes are what are gonna uh, help you during the, that short dead band time, where you do need some path for the back EMF during the dead band. When, once you turn the uh, once you switch from uh, using the uh, locked antiphase, so you have say these two FETs on, and then when you switch those off and these on, there's that slight dead band between the two, where you need the diodes to control the back EMF for that that teeny tiny small amount of time between the switching, because you don't want you don't want the switching to be so close that you have this one partially on and this one partially on at the same time and get a big current spike uh, doing a little bit of shoot through. All right, and then you have to have these pull down resistors in order for them to switch because if you remember, um, these gates float, once you turn them on, they're gonna stay on and, until you drain the charge off of them somehow. Okay. You can, uh, because we wanna have uh, the way this works, we have, well, so we have A prime and A, B prime and B. Uh, when we draw the, drive this with a locked antiphase, we're, we're turning, uh, we're generally turning the, the, A, the A, A and A prime on for uh, part of the time, and, and then B and B prime on for the other part of the duty cycle. And so we, we usually have two PWM outputs that are the exact inverse of each other. And, but you can avoid that by just using a little inverter. Um, <coughs> and then you can drive them all with one PWM signal. So, so this little H bridge that's on, our, that's on the motor shield, uh, it, can, it can handle a continuous current of five amps and a peak current of like 5.2 to 7.8. You can PWM it at frequencies up to about 10 kilohertz. Uh, once you go over that, it's a problem. Now, one of the reasons why you want to get up somewhere close to that is because there can be a little noise associated with it. Now, for our little hobby motors, it's not a big deal, but when you're running huge, big power motors uh, and you're running them at, say, 2 kilohertz, that's right in the middle of, of the range of speech, and it can be... Uh, uh, really a lot of noise and cause real problems. So, so if you can go a little faster, that's nice. It gets, a, gets it up so it's not quite so uh, irritating, although it can still be there, obviously, um, but a little easier to control. Uh, <clears throat> lower frequencies are hard to control with passive filtering, uh, and uh, higher frequencies you can filter with just uh, you know some sound shielding and stuff. Okay, let's see. Um, these H bridge, the, the 3387 has a charge pump built in to get uh, so that it can use N channels in the high side 
and it can get the gate voltage above the source voltage uh, far enough that you can um, that you can control it with your microprocessor. Um, it also has built in uh, if it detects a short a short circuit, uh, it'll shut down automatically. Over voltage or uh, under voltage or over temp conditions will also shut it down. And then it has uh, the it has two uh, two inputs that are independent, and um, and and that gives you the ability to switch the two outputs. Um, and then it has a couple of inputs uh, that basically shut the bridge down. It, it gives you two different ones. Um, one could be like a safety override button, and then the other one could be controlled by the microprocessor. Um, it can run up to 40 volts, but usually uh, specify 5 to 28 volts. And here's, a, here's the block diagram. And now if you look at this, notice you can see all of the FETs are N-channel FETs. And these are in the high side, these are in the low side, with power ground and uh, uh, voltage power up here. So that this would be the, the motor power. This might be 12 or 24 volts. The, over here, uh, we're going to run on 3.3 uh, on volts or 5 volts. There's a built-in 5 volt regulator to give us the control logic power, and it pulls that from the motor power. Here's our little charge pump that gives us the, uh, the extra voltage to, to control the high side and channel FET and be able to get the gate, the floating gate high enough to uh, fully turn on this FET. And uh, of course you don't need it for the low side. You just need to be above ground. So, um, yeah, and here's our over temperature detector, our under voltage detector. And here's the little control logic running at digital levels, of course. And here's some of the inputs. This is the enable input. This is the the uh, uh, these, this is your your uh, your PWM channels, your two channels, uh, and these normally are the exact inverse of each other. And then here are your uh, here are your motor output drives over here. And then you have uh, your disable one that's active high, your disable two that's active low. And then uh, there's this little bit of uh, feedback uh, that allows you to detect, uh, to current sense the current that's being delivered to your motor. Uh, and here's the typical interface. Here's your microprocessor. You have, you need to control the enable, the two PWM channels, and, uh, and then the, uh, the two uh, shutdowns and then you can, if you want to measure, sense the current, you can have have the feedback going into the analog to digital converter. With a little bit of filtering on it, and then this just connects to battery power or the motor power high, motor power ground, and here's your motor. Okay, so here's what your symmetric, uh, your well, oh, sorry. This is uh, symmetric versus asymmetric PD PWM. And remember, uh, uh, even even for our servos, we're using um, I forget now. That I've slipped my uh, so uh, center aligned versus edge aligned. So this is edge aligned PWM here, and this is center aligned. So in each PWM period here, notice these pulses are always centered in the window. Whereas these always, these are always re they're registered to to the edges of the window. And what we know is that that the that symmetric or center aligned PWM generates fewer harmonics in your output voltages and currents. Now that's that's it's not so much an issue when on a fixed duty cycle, but you see these harmonics are are different when you're changing your duty cycle. Because in the edge line, you're you're uh, you're 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 changing where this uh, where this uh, high duty cycle is in the window, whereas here you're always keeping it in the center. So basically, here it's moving, if you will. Whereas here, the center of the of the of the of the up of the on duty cycle time is always centered in the window, and that just cuts down on the harmonics versus this moving window. 
but again, just for when you change the duty cycle. Um, so, um, I don't know if you remember, but on the, on our pick, uh, our H bridge was double buffered in such a way that you uh, you could not change the duty cycle during a pulse period. You could only change the duty cycle at the at the very beginning of a pulse period, and this was to prevent weird things from happening and causing a weird control, especially with say servo drives or that sort of thing. Um, All right. Uh, so some advantages to locked anti-phase, you could you can get by with uh, one uh, one wire, uh, and it does allow for quick reversals. Uh, the downside is power still being used even when it's stopped. It does require higher frequency, and you have to have dead band. If you don't have dead band, then you're going to have shoot through every cycle for a small little motor uh, and and run it on low power. That that may not. Uh, it may not be too bad, but uh, but for big powerful things with fairly high voltages, you you can't really tolerate even you have to have this dead band. You can't tolerate even a teeny bit of shoot through. And um, so the side magnitude advantage is no power when it's stopped. It's a little simpler to understand, but you do have to have two different signals. Whereas with locked anti phase, your PWM signal is your entire control. It it is both direction and speed control, whereas in sign magnitude you have separate direction and speed control. PWM does the speed and then there's got to be a separate line for whether you're going forward or backward. A lot of commercial H bridges are available and you can buy them for small motors. They're, they're only maybe you know three four dollars for a, a cheap one. Uh, they have lots of built-in protection stuff. Uh, some can work in both modes, but some only in sign magnitude, some only in locked anti-phase. They, they all do have frequency limits. Some of them can be noisy. Uh, in my little Lincoln, I, it has a seat heater, and you can actually hear a little bit of the whine in the PWM when you turn on the seat heater. It's very, it's very subtle, but it's there. Um, and you can get these things in a whole wide range of, 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 abil of power ability, uh, how many amps they can handle and what voltages. So there's some good videos in this. Um, okay, let me just talk a little bit about servos. Um, so I, I know, I, I'm pretty sure I covered this in Micro 1. Um, I didn't really cover the H bridges in Micro 1, so that's why I wanted to do that first. Servos uh, are pretty straightforward. Uh, this is kind of a general generalized block diagram of a servo. You have, you have a motor, usually for hobby servos, it's a little cheap DC motor, uh, usually with brushes. And uh, then you have a gearbox to slow the rotation speed down to uh, uh, by uh, a pretty good amount of, uh, of, uh, of gearing. So, it's, so the motor is probably whizzing along pretty fast, but the actual output's turning, you know, not turning that fast. Then you have a position sensor on the output shaft. And, and generally, the output shaft is restricted to motion over 180 degrees. So it usually can't turn much more than that. Although if you force them, you can break off whatever, whatever the little um, dog that's in there that, that keeps that, that restricts that, that rotation. And then sometimes some of our servos will rotate 360 degrees. If your servo is doing that, we probably need to swap it out. Uh, you do have to be careful when you manually rotate them because you're working backwards through this gearbox. And as you know, when you do that, it it it, it makes it hard to, to turn them. And sometimes you can break them by forcing them. This position sensor is, uh, is essentially a potentiometer that changes its voltage output based on where the shaft is. As it varies over its 180 degrees roughly of range, it goes from, say, uh, zero volts to whatever the operating voltage is, uh, the digital operating voltage, which is say, uh, you know, 3.3 volts. So it can go from zero to 3.3 or maybe zero to five, depending. Uh, you have a you have a control input that comes in, and this control input uh, is a is a is a PWM signal, and this PWM signal is con its pulse width is then converted to a voltage. 
and fed in. So now this air amp is basically looking at the voltage from the position sensor and the voltage from this, uh, from this PWM signal in this pulse width to voltage converter and it compares them. And if they're identical, then it sends out a zero control signal, tells the motor not to move. But if there's an error, it's gonna, it's gonna tell the motor to, to go forwards or backwards and try and null out that error signal so that there's no error signal. It, and this is definitely a control loop. The, the motor is running on motor voltage, but, but the control pulse and the, and the position sensor, all this is running on um, logic voltage. Uh, so, um, or logic levels. Anyway, so when the control signal changes, then the positions, then there's an error and the motor moves until it nulls that air out, which means you've now put the servo in a new position. Um, here's another example. There's the little potentiometer. There's the air amplifier. And there's the reference output signal and the reference input signal. And this air detector basically takes any difference and runs the motor in the correct direction to try and null that out. And here's your gear reduction. So remember, for the servo, uh, the, the standard pulse period is defined to be 20 milliseconds. Now you can cheat on that. And in the code I wrote, I, I actually cheated. I'm running that, that period at 10 milliseconds. So I've cut it in half. And I do that to increase the, uh, increase the, the precision uh, of your control signal. Uh, the reason that's important is when you your, the actual range of useful control, your, your pulse, it starts off high and stays high and then goes low. And the time that it's high, the only useful variation is from something like 0.7 to 1 milliseconds, somewhere to 1.7 to 2 milliseconds, or maybe even 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. 2 so you really only get maybe, maybe from 1 to 2 milliseconds, or maybe from 0.7 to 2.3. Uh, three milliseconds and and so you can see if your duty cycle for the whole 20 milliseconds was hundred percent then you then only roughly something like 10 percent or maybe 15 percent uh, of the of the hundred percent of the duty cycle has any effect on the position of the servo so when it's way less than say point uh, point seven milliseconds or one millisecond it's going to be full clockwise and if you make it, say, a half millisecond, it's still going to be full clockwise. It's not going to do anything. Uh, only when you vary it between something like, say, 0.7 or 1 millisecond up to something like 1.7 or 2 milliseconds does the actual servo move. Uh, and then once you get above 2, or maybe it goes up to 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, but once you get past that, it's in full counterclockwise, and it's not ever, no matter how long the period stays high, it's not going to move this anymore. So the only useful operation range is really about one millisecond or from maybe 0.7 to maybe 2.2, something like that. Uh, when, you, when, your pulse, when your pulse is a 1.5 millisecond pulse in this 20 millisecond window, uh, then that 1.5 millisecond pulse then is usually represents the center position of the servo. And, um, yeah, so, so that's why, so remember, pulse period of 20 milliseconds, although you can cheat, and I am, I, so we're using 10, and that gives me then, uh, instead of, say, 10% of my duty cycle affects the position of the servo, now 20% of my duty cycle affects the position, and uh, so that gives me a, a lot more um, precision in my control. The original code uh, provided in the uh, in the uh, driver API uh, program that, that uh, you can download from the SDK in MCU Expresso, it only lets you control the duty cycle from zero to 100. That was it. Uh, so basically, then, if you ran it at 20 milliseconds, your your commands to this your commands to your servo would be. A duty cycle of one, 
uh, sorry, a duty cycle of 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, or 20. So basically, you got 10 different position, 10 different angles you could command the servo to be at. And that was it. Well, 10, 10 a, a, a precision of, of, of 10 steps across the 180 degrees, that's, that's 18 degrees per step. That's, that's quite a lot of motion, and that's really not good enough precision. So what I did, uh, I changed that from 0 to 100 to 0 to 1,000, and then I dropped the, the cycle from 20 to 10. So now you've got, uh, you basically have control from something like a little less than, um, um, uh, yeah, a little less from, say, 200, uh, well, I think the way it's set up now, it's like 75 to 220, something like that. Or 225, maybe. You may need to decrease that. You need to look at how your servo is moving, and you may need you may realize that uh, 75 makes it go too far down, and 225 makes it go too high up, and you may want to restrict those so so you limit the the travel of the servo uh, to uh, to not overstress your um, your tilt table arms. Uh, some of the tilt tables have bigger tabs on them where I connected the push rods than I should have put. And uh, some of these days I need to take all the tables off, uh, saw those rods down into, into shorter and redrill the holes, but I haven't done that yet. Uh, but one of these days I'll do that and that'll make them a little bit nicer. Um, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and even linear actuators that are, that are, that are effectively servos where, uh, you know, z zero degrees is here and 180 is down there or whatever. Here's, here's another uh, little, um, little actuator that's a linear actuator. Um, so they come in all sorts, sorts of shapes and sizes. This one's pretty small. That's a standard hobby servo there, a high-tech HS422. Here are some big industrial servos. You can see some of those are pretty, uh, pretty uh, robust uh, and can put some serious torque on things. Um, and their 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 control ability is a lot more precise than, uh, say, this little hobby servo. Okay, um, I did want to just take a minute and talk about uh, using um, using switches where you need to switch higher loads and higher voltages, higher currents. Then your microprocessor can source or sync. Um, for a BJT, there's it's important to put these in the circuit correctly, and um, you when you want to switch the high side, you want to sw you want to use a uh, a PNP BJT transistor. You don't want to use an MPN, and the reason is uh, that that your base current. And remember, with a with a BJT, current does flow either into the base or out of the base, out of the base in a, G, in a MPN, into the base in a PMP. So if you're switching the high side, uh, you, you, you don't want your current through the base also going through the load because that just makes the control a little less robust. So you want to use an MPN where the current comes from your power through the emitter, through the base, and through the through the current limiting resistor and it's synced by the micro and then the rest of the current runs out the uh, collector and through the load but the cur the base current does not go through the load which means if the load varies there's still no variation in the base current which means that the transistor is going to be it, it's not it's not going to be susceptible to some effect of the load whereas here the if you're using a PNP in the high, uh, sorry, uh, an MPN in the high side, your current is sourced by the micro through the current limiting base resistor, uh, and then goes out the emitter. The power comes from the collector through the through the through the uh, PN junctions out the emitter and through the load. So your base current is also in your load. So if your load changes, you're going to have an effect on your base current, and that's going to that could uh, take you out of full saturation depending on you know how much of an effect it had so you do have to be so this just isn't as good a design and that the same exact thing applies in reverse if you're using uh, if you're switching the low side 
we you would you want to use an MPN and not a PMP for the same reason. Now, here's the question: which is a better idea to switch high sides or to switch low sides? And the answer is, you know, for, for low voltage devices and you know uh, low current devices and stuff you're doing probably doesn't make that much difference. But as a general principle, we want to switch the high side because we, we, want, we want the load to stay grounded and, and we want the, the, the positive power to not be connected to our load. I'm sorry, sorry. So what we want is we want to switch the high side. But, uh, but you know, you can also switch the low side. It, it's, it's fine depending on, you know, if, there's, if you don't have to worry about somebody accidentally touching some of this or something accidentally getting shorted the ground, uh, then you could switch. Then you can switch the low side. But it's but in general we want to switch the high side. So we want to be above the load, not below the load. All right. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about relays. I just you know just to keep in mind that that uh, solid state relays are have so many advantages over over uh, mechanical relays. Uh, the biggest thing is no mechanical parts to wear out. You also get a very good degree of isolation between the relay and your microprocessor. And they can, ha they can also handle high currents, although um, mechanical relays can, can be made to handle super, super high currents. And of course, for things like switching, you know, million volt transmission lines or, you know, 500,000 volt transmission lines, we're never gonna use solid state devices for that. Uh, <coughs> We're clearly going to use, uh, uh, you know, big, crazy, uh, gigantic, uh, you know, mechanical relays to do that, uh, with all sorts of built-in, you know, high voltage uh, arcing protection and stuff. So when the circuit's broken, there's always a big arc that's drawn, and uh, ways of quenching that and whatnot. Uh, so, also the solid-state relays can switch a lot faster. Um, there's very low drive current. There's no, the back EMF that comes off of coils when you switch them is gone. Um, and they can be made a lot smaller. Um, mechanical relays, uh, they can be made pretty small, but there's never, they're, they're always bigger uh, than, than our solid state devices. Uh, we have a lot of these solid state relays. They look like these square, big plastic things. They typically have a, uh, an output side. <coughs> the output side can be uh, AC or DC. You can buy them in either form. And then the input, this one shows pretty high voltage in AC, but normally they're controlled by DC and usually they only have to have uh, three volts or better, one, one and a half volts or better to, to run them. Uh, and the current draw is almost negligible, just a few milliamps. There's a tremendous isolation from the DC, from the low voltage control side to the high power side uh, so that you don't have to worry about this failing and shorting out your blowing up all your logic your your uh, you know TTL level stuff running at 5 volts uh, they can be a little bit expensive you know they can cost 20 bucks a pop you can get them cheaper than that you can get them for 5 bucks but uh, so much less noise the mechanical relays um, Mechanical relays have to—you still have to design with them, and you have to have some minimal current when you uh, when you separate contacts because uh, if you don't have enough current, you won't get the little bit of arc that it, they use to clean the contacts. Um, you do have to have uh, flyback diodes, uh, and they are mechanical; they will break down over time. But the nice thing is, if you have some very high reactive loads. Uh, the contacts can handle those fine, whereas solid state has a little more problem with that. And you can get them in these little small packages. You've probably seen them on printed circuit boards. Uh, they're still used a lot. They, there are a lot of specs for these things, and you do have to pay attention to the specs. All right, I think we'll quit with that. Um, and um, then we will... Um, uh, I, I'm going to send out an e email. I'm I, I do want everybody to be... Uh, really seriously can you know 
trying to put together a small group and picking up a tilt table and getting it calibrated uh, this week. And then next week you can start working on your algorithm. So, so please think about that. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. Uh, I'll have you just dry lab it and write the code without really, uh, uh, without really running the code. But that's gonna, that's not gonna be nearly as satisfying. Uh, it's gonna be a bigger pain to do that. All right. With that, we will, uh, we'll talk to you later.